on this computer. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now is it say it's recording? Is it working now? Oh uh, yeah, it is. It's recording. Okay, cool. Let me start again. Clinical skills and CSSE. I'm Forzan, and let's get straight into it. So, first acknowledgements. I pretty much used like a lot of information from the clinical skills books and last year's revision lecture. So kudos to them. Then clinical skills is probably like the subject that this year has been the most kind of affected, I think, because in terms of assessment for clinical skills, normally you guys would have uh, some practical CSSEs, both in SIM 1 and SIM 2, where you'd go in and do stuff with a patient and all that kind of stuff. And you'd get exam questions on it as well, right? But due to COVID, you're not having any of the practical stuff, but you're still probably going to have to do that at the start of next year if, um, touch wood, they have those intensives, right? So this is all still important. And clinical skills is also a really good way to kind of consolidate your knowledge of anatomy and physiology because anatomy and physiology is kind of like the academic stuff of like, yes, this is how the heart works, et cetera. But then if you've got a good clinical skills base, you can see, oh, right heart failure causes X, Y, and Z. And because I know my anatomy, I can link those two together and it makes it easy for me to answer both clinical skills questions, physiology questions, and um, anatomy questions, if that makes sense. So let's get straight into it. So we've got histories and it was really hard to find any quality memes to put on this. So sorry, because these are from like 2008, but histories. So this is probably one of the most important things that you'll do as a doctor, because they keep telling us that, oh, 90% of the time you can get a diagnosis from a good history. So this is the basic structure of a history, and this is what you'd be doing when you're in a CSSE. So you come in, you do your hand hygiene first. That's what I usually do. You do your introduction where you say who you are and why you're here, like you're here to do a history. You do confidentiality. You say something along the lines of, as I'm the same as any other medical professional, everything between us is between you, me, and the treating team. And then you get their consent by explaining all that and asking them if it's okay. Yep. Then you do identifying data. So you have your name, I mean their name first, their date of birth, and I usually ask age and date of birth, so you don't have to do the maths. And you ask, quote, are you of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin? You don't say anything else, you just ask that and they'll say yes or no. If they say yes, you say, um, is that yes to being Aboriginal, being Torres Strait Islander, or both? And that's something you have to ask, like legally, I think. Okay. And then you finally get into the actual meat of the history where you ask their history of presenting complaint, which is kind of like, why are you here? So you'd start off with an open-ended question. Um, and be like, so what brings you into the doctors today? Then you'd go into your WWQQAA and all this stuff is going to be expanded on in future slides, but I'm just going through the um, basic structure first, your bias. Then you do a systems review uh, if you have to do one. So you guys know the musculoskeletal system the peripheral nervous system and uh, cardio. I think that's the one that you guys know. And at year one level, I'm pretty sure you only choose one. So they'll come and say, oh, doctor, my chest hurts when I climb stairs or when I do exercise. And 90% of the time, that's going to be cardiovascular. So you'll pick that, right? But they'll often ask you to like also put in a couple of extra musculoskeletal questions or something like that, just to be like, make sure that you're thinking a little bit laterally. Then you'd go on to your past medical history, your medications history, your family history, your social history, and then you'd wrap up the interview. So now we're gonna go into these in a little bit more structure. So first you start off with your history of presenting complaints. So you use the WWQQAA BICE framework. So first of, all, first of all, you start off with like, when did it start? So you go, like, was it, did it come on suddenly or was it gradual? Cause that can mean different things, obviously. And you ask like, where is it? So where is something that's like not always asked? Like it depends on what the person is actually complaining about. If they're complaining about pain, you'd ask like, oh, where is it? Does it radiate anywhere? Or that kind of thing, right? But if they're saying, oh, doctor, I feel short of breath, you're not going to ask where. So this is just a framework. Be a little bit smart about how you use it, right? Next, you'd ask about quantity, especially when it's something like pain or even shortness of breath or coughing even. And it, the point of this is just to see like, how bad is this uh, symptom that you're coming in and complaining about? Oftentimes you can ask them to rate it out of 10, where you have to specify like zero is, you know, totally fine. And 10 is the worst of this like ever, okay? And 
you got to like think about it like different symptoms will have different meanings when you ask about quantity so like a cough can be like oh i'm constantly coughing or like oh it's just a little <laughs> like sniffle occasionally right then the second cue is uh quality which goes on to like um this is also more of a pain thing you ask like what type of pain you can give examples like is it burning pain throbbing pain all that kind of stuff and it, it'll differ depending on the um symptom again and then you get into the A's, and the A's are associated with so anything else that's happening. Like, if you're short of breath, are you having chest pain? Like, asking associated symptoms really makes it easier to get a diagnosis, even though that's not what you're really doing in first year. And then, yeah, and then you go into aggravating and, al aggravating and alleviating factors, right? Which is, is there anything that makes it worse or anything that makes it better? Uh, oftentimes, it would be better as an, oh, I stopped a rest, or I took a Panadol, that kind of thing. Now, BICE is something that um, when I was in first year, I was like, oh, why would we ask that? Like, that's so dumb. Like, if the patient knew what was going on, why would they come to the doctors, right? But it actually ends up being quite important. So, like, beliefs. What does the patient think it could be? It's pretty good information. So, you're like, the patient comes in with, like, chest pain or something. And then they're like, oh, oh I hope it's, like, maybe what if it's, like, a heart attack? Because my um, family is, like, really, really prone to heart attacks, right? So, that kind of stuff, it's kind of the information that the patient might not say initially but it can be really important so you can be like oh snap this person's family's got this rare condition running in them maybe i should think about that right same with impact because it just is an easy way to tell like how bad it's getting concerns again like oh i'm hoping it's not a heart attack because like my dad had a heart attack and my mom and then finally you've got expectations which um yeah it's this is more of an iffy question like it feels weird to just ask, oh, what do you want to get out of this consultation? And they just say, yeah, I want to get my um, presenting complaint fixed. Yeah, but it's still something you got to ask. Okay, now move it, moving on to systems reviews. And so systems reviews are really important because if you know your systems review well, it's really good for um, linking in with anatomy and physiology. So when I present this part, I'm going to be focusing less on ways to remember the questions like, because you're not doing like CSSEs or OSCEs very soon. But I'm gonna be focusing more on why we ask certain questions and what it can mean, because I think that makes it really easy to, um, it'll make it better for your exams because you'll be able to understand things a bit better in that way. So the first system that you guys uh, learnt was your musculoskeletal system, right? So the mnemonic that we learned, I don't know if you guys learnt it, is pills with DJ Chi. I'm not sure who that is, but it's a thing. So P for pain, I for instability, L for loss of motion, L for loss of function, S for swelling, W for weakness, D for deformity, J for joint stiffness, and C for changes in sensation. So that's just a thing. When, it guys come, when you guys end up having to do this in your intensives or whatever, look at that. But I'm going to go more into like, why do you ask certain things? So first of all, pain is important because um like is it bone pain like really deep like insidious kind of pain or is it like your familiar kind of muscle pain where oh it hurts when i move my arm right because that can help point to what it could be right and when does the pain come on what do you do um swelling is another thing swelling indicates a lot of things including like injury but also like um infection and all that kind of stuff and you can ask things like is it like hard swelling is it is it soft like does it feel like there's liquid in there and like, does it, is it warm? That kind of thing. Instability is a thing just for bones and joints. Cause if the patient feels that like, oh, when I move my arm, it feels like my elbow is going to come out. That, you know, points to maybe it's like a ligament problem or a joint problem, right? Deformity, it's pretty obvious, but it just helps point to like where the problem is. So like the patient comes in and like the arms like bent back. It's like, do you see any deformity? It's like, yeah. And then, you know, like that's a place to look, right? Then you've got loss of motion, which is, Loss of motion and loss of function are things that you need to make a distinction between. So loss of motion is, can the joint move properly? Like, do you have the full range of motion or does it hurt or anything like that, right? And loss of function is more like, it's kind of a function of loss of motion because it's like, oh, can you do your daily tasks? Like, oh, I can't brush my hair, which means this movement is hard for me, right? So that's just a thing you need to know. Motion is just pure motion and function is like being able to do activities, okay? And then weakness is another thing. Weakness is often a little bit more like 
uh, injury or it can be a peripheral nervous system because that's weakness is something you see there. So it's, it's always good to ask the extent, right? And we'll, there's also a grading scale for weakness, but that's more of a examination thing which we'll get into later. When you ask about joint stiffness, joint stiffness is really important because if, you, if they get joint stiffness in the morning, then that means that they, it's something that's pointing to really strongly arthritis, right? And if they get joint stiffness that like lasts, I think longer than 30 minutes, like longer than an hour in the morning, that is rheumatoid arthritis, yeah? And if it only lasts like less than 30 minutes in the morning, that's osteoarthritis. That's just a good thing to remember because that's the kind of thing that they might ask about in the exams. Then we've got changes in sensation. It's another thing you ask. Um, it's more of a peripheral nervous system thing, obviously, because your nerves carry sensation, but uh, musculoskeletal injuries can put nerves at risk. Like, um, for example, like you guys know how your radial nerve or whatever um, can be at risk when you break your arm or whatever. So that kind of thing. Next, we've got uh, the neurological system, and this is the systems review for that. So there's a few ways to kind of learn this one. But I've, I've got two ways for you to remember it. So this is a mnemonic called head swing. And it's just like headache, E for ears, eyes, ears, and nose, A for anesthesia and paresthesia, D for dizziness, syncope, and vertigo. So they're kind of grouping symptoms to some extent. S for seizures, H for head injury, especially with loss of consciousness, W for weakness, I for incontinence, N for neck stiffness, and G for gait or movement problems. But the other thing, the other way that I sort of learned it was to take this, the neurological system is kind of all pervasive in your body, right? Because your nerves kind of have to go everywhere to make your body work. So you can group these symptoms into kind of the basic areas where they uh, cause things, right? So you can start off with like the systemic symptoms, for example, like fainting, seizures, and dizziness, right? Because those are whole body things. And then I go into like the head symptoms. So you've got headache, obviously. Neck stiffness. Neck stiffness is kind of a, uh, it's, it's a buzzword for meningitis usually because your meninges can kind of cover up your spinal cord, your brain. And if they get inflamed, it really hurts to like move your neck uh, up and down. That's the thing to remember. Head injury is obviously a good one because if you come in with like, I don't know, uh, a concussion or anything like that, head injury is probably something that's going to cause uh, neurological symptoms. Vision, hearing, and taste disturbances. Those are like kind of stroke just like general head injury things because um, those kind of nerves, you guys don't need to know this yet, but the nerves that kind of uh, supply those organs and those uh, sensors, they come straight off your brain. So they're quite uh, vulnerable to changes in brain pressure or just being squeezed on by um, injuries or like swelling. And then you've got switch, speech and swallowing, which is similar to the muscles that like um, do your tongue and your larynx because once again, those come out off your brain. So these are like your brain and like head symptoms. Then you've got the more peripheral things. So like I pointed to the arm for this one. So you've got like weakness because uh, your nerves supply your arm. So if you, you get upper motor neuron lesions and stuff like that, or lower motor neuron lesions, which like result in weakness or paralysis. Then you've got paresthesia, anesthesia, same. Where if you've got a problem conducting that um, sensory information back to your brain, you'll have those symptoms. Gait changes. Um, same thing. Gait changes can also be like cerebellar, I think. And involuntary movements, that's like twitching and fasciculations and disturbance of sphincter control. Once again, if you're losing innovation to those kind of areas, you can't keep your um, external or internal anal sphincter or urethral sphincters shut. So you end up just voiding uh, when you don't want to. So I think later on in this uh, lecture, we go into a little bit more about like upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesions and the differences, because that's something that they do like to ask. But um, just keep that in mind. We'll go on to that in a bit. Next, we've got my favorite uh, system from first year, which is cardiovascular, because it feels really doctory. And a lot of the, they ask a lot of questions about cardio, right? And if you understand the reasons we ask these questions and that kind of stuff, it'll make it easy to answer them in the exam. So the mnemonic that they use uh, is, well, paid cops are fatigued. So P for palpitations, A for ankle edema, I for intermittent claudication, D for dyspnea, C for chest pain, O for orthopnea, P for paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, syncope, 
and fatigues. Paid cops are fatigued. Now, that's a lot of big words, and I'm sure you know them, but I am going to go through them and what they mean, because I think that's, this is really important. This is quite high yield, in my opinion. So first of all, chest pain. There's a few different types. So if they just get a crushing retrosternal chest pain, that is, and it's quite like acute, that points to a heart attack so, or an AMI. So remember that. If the chest pain is more burning and it comes on after meals and stuff or when lying down, that's actually not cardiovascular, but people might think it is. That's uh, reflux. So like gourd or something like that. And if the chest pain comes on with exercise and goes away, well, usually when you stop exercising, that's angina. And what angina is, it's like your carotid arteries that are supplying your heart have uh, narrowed, but not like occluded, but they've narrowed, which means that your heart's like has trouble getting enough blood when it needs to work hard. So when it needs to work hard, like when you're exercising, it starts hurting because it gets like transiently like ischemic because it doesn't get enough blood. So that's important. Next, we've got palpitations. Uh, palpitations can be benign. Like if you're stressed, you can get palpitations or they can point to arrhythmias. Uh, nothing super specific there. Dyspnea is shortness of breath. So that can be like heart failure, uh, like left heart failure. And that can also be acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. That's another thing. Orthopnea. This is one of the ones that when I was in first year, I was like, why you, why can't you breathe or whatever when, you, when you're lying down, right? So what's actually happening is in orthopnea, it's when you lie down, they feel short of breath, right? And this is the question you ask me, like, so how many pillows do you sleep on at night, right? And has that increased? And the reason that orthopnea happens is due to left heart failure. So if you imagine all the um, stuff from the pulmonary veins, which is going to be reoxygenated blood coming back from the lungs, right? That's going to go into your left atrium to be ready to be shipped out to the rest of the body through the um, left ventricle, right? So if you get left heart failure, that kind of backs up back into the lungs, right? And veins are usually meant to be a low pressure system. But when stuff backs up, the um, plasma and fluid will kind of leak out, right? Which will mean that you end up with fluid in your lungs, right? So if you're standing or sitting up straight, fluid follows gravity. So it's going to come down and just be like there and you can still mostly breathe. But when you lie down, it'll kind of fill up your lungs all the way like that, which makes it hard for them to breathe. So that's how orthopnea works. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is pretty much like they go to sleep and then they wake up at night short of breath, like running to the window, uh, trying to breathe, right? It's a similar mechanism to orthopnea. Intermittent claudication is something different. So intermittent claudication is you ask like, okay, so if you're going out for a walk, right? Do you like start getting like quite intense, well not intense, but like noticeable ankle pain, like really sore ankles after only a really short walk, like 50 meters, right? And that is peripheral, peripheral artery disease. So the arteries that like in their legs, like the femoral, I guess, that kind of stuff, they would have narrowed due to like, well, um, cholesterol building up and all that kind of stuff. So it's similar to angina. It's like when your heart, um, like when your legs need to work hard, they're not getting enough blood. So they get painful, right? And yeah. And so intermittent claudication will come on after only a really short time or a really short walk. And it will go away as soon as you start resting because your legs stop needing as much oxygen, if that makes sense. Okay. Then you've got ankle edema, which points to right heart failure. So left heart failure puts fluid in your lungs, right? Right heart failure puts fluid in your peripheries. That's because all the peripheral blood from your veins obviously goes back to your right atrium, to the right ventricle in order to go to the lungs to be reoxygenated, right? So for right heart failure, your right um, heart isn't pumping properly or pumping enough, which means all that blood is backing up into your peripheral veins and a, uh, the, li the liquid is kind of oozing out and it results in edema. And the kind of edema that you see is pitting edema. So it's like they've got straight up liquid in their calves. And if you press down, it'll leave a little divot where you put your thumb. Syncope, nothing much specific there, honestly. Just like um, you don't get enough uh, blood supply or you have low blood pressure because you got up too fast or something. Brain doesn't get enough oxygen and it just like faints. Fair enough. And fatigue, that's a very heart failure thing because you're not getting enough blood to the rest of your body, which means that like, well, you feel tired. Cool. And then after those systems review questions, you'll have, you probably want to ask these constitutional or systemic questions. So 
I get, I've been told like different things about which ones to ask, but I've put the, um, the few main ones that are the most important. So malaise is just feeling bad in general, because it's like, if someone feels bad, there's probably something wrong, it's, especially if it's something like non-specific. The other one's like fatigue, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. So if you get fever, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss, that's like a bad sign. That is like ringing the bell for cancer pretty much, okay? But these, these don't mean just cancer. So like infections obviously cause fever. So that's something to think about. Um, stuff like hyper and hypothyroidism. I don't know if you guys need to know that that much, but like that can cause fatigue and weight loss and stuff. And anemia, all that kind of stuff causes really like non-specific symptoms. And this is like the kind of stuff you ask just in case, because it's like they come in with a specific thing, but if there's something bigger going on, you want to ask because something bigger might just make them feel a little bit crook in general. Okay. And then extra stuff, you might want to ask travel, but you can ask that later on. And just like, do you have pain anywhere else? You bleeding, like bruising, anything like that, just to cover your bases. Next, we've got your past medical history. So we've finished systems review. Now we're going back to um, the history, history part. So there's like six things you need to ask. And the kind of uh, mnemonic that people use is like, oh shit, kids. So O for ongoing or chronic medical conditions. And the ones that you want to ask are A, B, C, D. So asthma, hypertension. The reason hypertension um, starts with B is because like blood pressure. Uh, C for cancer and D for diabetes. And then O and then S for surgery. So you ask like, oh, have you had any surgeries? Because um, that can point to stuff. Appendectomy is usually a common one they say in CSSEs or in questions. Then you've got H for hospitalizations. So like, have you had any major illnesses? Have you had to go to the hospital? Because, you know, obviously that's important to figure out what's going on. I for immunizations. This is just something you ask. Are your immunizations up to date? And 90% of the time in CSSEs, they'll just say yes. Um, then you've got travel. So travel is like, the reason for that is if you go to like tropical countries, you might get diarrheal illnesses or like malaria or something. And that'll be like, that's usually something important. And then you've got like, oh shit, kids, kids for childhood. So you ask them about childhood illnesses because like something can come back, I guess. Like if you get, um, what is it? If you get chicken pox as a kid, you know, it comes back as shingles. So that's one of the ones that you want to think about there. Okay. Then we've got medications history. So I'll do the mnemonic again. So the mnemonic is pretty good for this one. It's just drugs. So the mnemonic is good for covering everything, but don't ask it in this order because it doesn't make any sense. So drugs, doctor prescribed, as in like prescription, recreational, user prescribed, over the counter, gynecological, and sensitivities. So uh, you probably wanna change the order to what I've got in the actual slide. So you've got doctor prescribed. This is probably the most important one usually because it not only tells you what like diseases they have, but like uh, a lot of the things can be caused by side effects. So you wanna ask like, what are you taking? What for? Like what, what reason? Um, the, the dosage, like what time they take it, how much they take it, how do they take it? Like uh, insulin is like an injection, uh, most things are pills, that kind of thing. And you gotta ask, are they compliant? And you've also gotta ask about um, reactions or any adverse effects that are happening. And this is also a good place to ask gynecological if the uh, person, uh, if it's relevant to the person, right? So next one you wanna ask is over-the-counter medication. So this is user prescribed. So what, what, what are they taking? You ask what dosage. Um, and if they've been like, oh, I took Panadol for this pain that I came to um, complain to you about. You also ask like, oh, is it working? All right? Because that's probably a good one. Then you ask alternative and complementary medication. That's also important. So you ask what the dosage and the thing about this one is a lot of people don't consider a lot of the things that they do to be alternative and complementary medicine when they actually are, right? So you might give examples like, oh, do you take any complementary? And they go, no. And you say, okay, just to be sure, like herbal remedies, anything like vitamins, anything like that. And then that's just to make sure you're not missing any information. Next up is alcohol. You ask, do they drink? They say, yes. They go, what do you drink? How much? How often? Right? And most people say, oh, I only have a couple of glasses. Uh, on the weekends or whatever. And then you go, how much is a couple? How much is a couple of drinks to you? And a good thing that they told us to do in first year, but I don't know how apl like, applicable it would be in real life is to be like, so a few, is that like 10 standards? And then they go, no, no, no. I mean like four or five, because 
if you say, oh, couples, you mean like one standard, it'll make them look better. So they'll just be like, oh yeah, I only have one standard a day uh, or whatever. So you highball it to make them tell you the truth. Now, if they, if they drink too much, I've forgotten the exact number. I think it's like four standard drinks or something per night or two or three, like every day or something. You ask them the cage questions, which is like, do you want to, do you ever want to cut down on your drinking? Are you ever annoyed when other people tell you to cut down? Do you ever feel guilty about your drinking? And do you ever need an eye opener? Which means like when you get up in the morning, are you like non-functional unless like, are you having trouble functioning unless you have a drink, right? Then you move on to smoking, right? So I think alcohol, smoking and recreational drugs kind of fall into the same umbrella, but you have to ask alcohol and smoking separately because they're like the legal ones, I guess. So when you ask about smoking, you ask them, do you smoke? And then super importantly, this is like the, like the oldest trick in the book. You ask like, have you ever? Because a lot of the times they'll be like, no, I don't smoke. But they've actually smoked for like 20 years and they've just quit like a year ago, which is fair enough. And then you ask, how much do you smoke? Like um, how many cigarettes a day for how long? And a pack a day for a pack every single day for a year, which is 20 cigarettes a day, I think is a pack year so you can use that to calculate pack years but you probably don't need to um usually think about it too much unless you're uh summarizing back and then if they say they're smoking you just quickly ask oh have you thought about quitting to make yourself look good then they then you ask recreational drugs so don't be judgmental when you ask about recreational drugs like it doesn't matter what your attitude towards recreational drugs is just try to be like caring and um non-judgmental and you'll be more likely to get a legit answer and then treat it seriously, like be like, oh, if someone says, oh, I smoke marijuana, they go, well, how much do you smoke? Like how often? And have you had any uh, bad effects or anything? Maybe you might ask that. Then finally, you've got sensitivities and allergies. So you ask like to what? And then you ask like what kind? Like what is actually happening? Because so, a anaphylactic reaction is really different from someone just getting like hives or a rash or something, right? Then we move on to family history. So... Family history, you kind of want information on two generations, I think is the sweet spot. So you ask about any general conditions that run in the family. And so they'll be like, oh yeah, um, diabetes or hypertension. And that can just be pretty valuable. And then you usually ask about their parents first because they're probably quite likely to know about their parents' uh, um, history. And you change how you ask it depending on the age of the person. Like maybe if they're really old, you might ask like, oh, are your parents are still with us or something. Or if they're quite young, you might just ask normally like, oh, how are your parents doing or something? Just that's up to your discretion. So you ask their ages, ask about their current and past health and if they've had any conditions. And if they're dead, it feels a bit bad, but you've got to ask about how they died because that's important. Then you might ask about their siblings. Again, you ask ages and genders. Um, ask about current and past health. Die, if they died, ask about how they died. Be empathetic, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, um, if you need another like generation, if they don't have any siblings, you might ask if they've got children, depending on like the age of the person, right? Ask ages and genders, health conditions, same stuff. And if you're really um, running short and they don't have any siblings or children, you might want to ask about their grandparents, but they're unlikely to know a lot about them. Then we go on to social history. I don't know if you guys have had Craig Hassid this year, but this is like, this is his, um, this is his wheelhouse. So this is where you ask about like essence pretty much. So education, stress management, spirituality, exercise, nutrition, connectedness, and environment. So uh, like there's not much to go into on this. You pretty much just ask those things. And the reason that you ask them is because depending on a person's living situation and stuff like their diet, their exercise, it can often facilitate uh, progression or like of disease, right? So it's an important thing to ask just because you want to make sure that they don't have a situation which is making them sick. Because a lot of the time doctors are like, they want to fix the problem that's in front of them, but we can't forget about what's like the big picture that might be causing someone to come in sick so often, right? And quick tips for asking questions about this. You might just ask like, instead of saying, how's your exercise or how's your diet and sounding like, um, like you're accusing them of something, you might just like ask like, oh, can you tell me about X, Y, Z? And uh, this is another one of those things we want to probe a little bit deeper if they give you kind of a vague answer. So if they're like, um, oh yeah, my diet's good. Can you be like, oh, um, well then what do you eat normally? And they'll be like, oh, I have fruits and veggies and all that kind of stuff. You can live with that. Social history, done. Okay, that's the history. Now we've got the most important, well, not the most important, but definitely the most fun part, 
which is examination. And I'm really sorry that you guys haven't really had a chance to um, do examinations yet, but I'm sure you would have learned it in clinical skills. So this will be pretty good. Uh, this will be pretty good revision for that. And especially for intensive next year. And these are the questions that you'll get asking exam a lot of. So examination. Usually when you do an examination, you don't just go in and start feeling for stuff, right? You have to start holistically. So you start off with general appearance, then usually you do vitals, but um, most of the time in a CSSE, you won't actually do vitals. I'll just give them to you. Then you look, you feel, and then you, then you do the proper, exa proper examination, and then you do the special tests. The examination is separate to the history and it's like, the history is asking for what the patient knows and the examination is us going in and looking for things that'll help us figure out what's going on. Once again, just like histories, when you do a CSSC for an examination, you might have to come in, introduce yourself, confidentiality, same stuff, except what you also do in an examination is that you'll tell them like, okay, so we're doing this examination. I'm going to be feeling these different things. Like for a cardio one, I'll be feeling your hands, um, arms, neck, chest, all that kind of stuff. And due to that, I'm going to need you to expose your upper body for me, which will mean taking off your shirt, that kind of thing, because you want to make sure that the patient knows what's going on because it's uh, quite a bad, quite bad form. If you're like doing examination, they're like, okay, now take your shirt off. And the patient's like, Oh, what? Right. The other thing is uh, when you're doing an examination, I don't know why it's just tradition at this point, you always examination examine from the right side of the patient. That's just another important thing. That's just something to remember and something to do every single time. Okay. So we'll start off with a cardio exam. Um, so once again, examine from the right side. In the cardio exam, you start off with general appearance. So general appearance is usually you look at the whole body first and that's kind of stuff like, oh, um, do they look well? Like, are they like, do they look tired or in pain? Are they like hunched over? Um, do they have any like obvious aids? Like are they sitting in a wheelchair or do they have like an O2 tank next to them, right? Then like body habitus, which just, um, it's kind of like BMI in general. So you just, it's either normal, under or overweight, but you don't say that. If you really want to say something, you might say body habit is noted if someone is under or overweight, but just leave it. And then for the cardiovascular exam, you do specific things. Like when you look at the whole body, you look for stuff that would predispose the person to cardiovascular conditions. Like you might do, might look for Down syndrome features or Marfan's features, which is like Marfan's like really tall and like lanky kind of thing and turners as well. So now when we actually start the examination after you've done the vitals and you've looked, we look with, you start with infection, uh, inspection, which is looking. So when you do inspection, you usually start distal and you work proximal. So in this case, we start with the hands. So these are kind of grouped into what they mean. So the first thing you look for is peripheral cyanosis, which is like, are their fingers like and hands like blue? Um, you look for capillary refill, which is pretty much you press down on their cap cap capillary bed for like a few seconds and you let it go and you see how quickly it turns red again as the blood comes back. And then you do clubbing as well. Clubbing, uh, it's a bit weird because it can be a lot of things, including like heart disease, but also COPD and stuff. But I think in general, it's related to perfusion. So all three of these are related to, is this person getting blood to their extremities pretty much? Next, you're looking for tendon xanthomata, which is like at the backs of your hands, like on your um, finger tendons, right? You'll see these bumps of like cholesterol deposits. And you're also looking for tar stains, like your fingers look like a little black and orangey because you smoke. These two are kind of like lifestyle. They point to like either obesity or smoking, which can definitely predispose you to cardiovascular risk, cardiovascular disease. Then these three are the ones you're gonna wanna look for for infective endocarditis. So splinter hemorrhages, you can see the picture on the right, which is like the little nail, it's got the little um, little hemorrhage in there. Then you've got Osler's nodes, which are kind of on your fingers. And a thing I was told is that Osler's nodes, O for ouch, because Osler's nodes hurt, okay? And then you've got Janeway lesions, which are on your palm, that's another picture there. Cool. Then after you do the hands uh, for the cardiovascular exam, you'd move on to the wrists. Oh, and also, by the way, guys, um, if you've got any questions, I can't really see the chat. So if you've got any questions, just yell out while I'm doing this. Um, so anyway, moving on from the hands, you obviously go to the wrists because that's the next most proximal uh, distal thing. 
So you start off by taking the radial pulse just on one hand and you do it for 30 seconds and then you multiply it by two to get that pulse rate. You say the rate and you say whether it's in the normal range, which is 60 to 100, and you do the rhythm, which is like, just, is it regular, which is good? Is it irregular? If it's irregular, is it irregularly irregular, which is like, there's no pattern, or if it's just um, regularly irregular, which is like, there's a pattern, but it's not regular. The, you can do radio radial delay, which pretty much points to coarctation of the aorta. So what you do is you feel both radial pulses at the same time, and you make sure that they're coming through at the same time, because otherwise that means that there's a delay in the aorta pretty much, something like stopping it. Brachial pulse, um, you can sometimes do that. That's the one here, right? It can be kind of hard to feel sometimes. It's kind of deep. You might have to get in there a little bit. And then you say something along the lines of like, normally um, you might want to do radio femoral delay, but we don't do it at this level. And that's because you're testing the delay between your radial pulse and the femoral pulse, which is like in your crotch region. And they don't want you doing that to the uh, sim patients, which is fair enough. Next, you pretty much move on from the arms straight to the eyes, okay? So, well, to the face. And I think we're gonna start with the eyes in this, in this case. So first thing you look for is jaundice. So is, do the conjunctiva when you do that, do they look a bit yellow, as you can see in that bottom picture? And then you can also look for the pallor of con conjunctiva while you do that. So is that red bit under your eye looking kind of pale? That can mean an anemia. Jaundice points to um, liver issues generally. Arcosinolis is these, um, in the second picture, that blue ring you see a lot around the iris of the person. That's usually like an old person thing. And it pretty much means that like, you've got a lot of cholesterol, so it's kind of building up there. Xanthalesma is lipid deposits around the eyes. So you can see on this person, they've got those yellow things. Once again, cholesterol. They don't point to a specific heart disease, but if you've got that much cholesterol, um, you've probably, it's probably building up in your arteries as well, which is why we look for it. Next, you do the face in general. Yeah, you just look for like this kind of weird uh, red kind of rash almost, like flushness. It's, it points to um, mitral valve stenosis, pretty much. And it's not to be confused with the butterfly rash you get with lupus, but you guys don't need to know that, so it's okay. Then you move on to the mouth. So the mouth is where you do central cyanosis. So you look for their lips and tongue. Are they like blue or are they a normal, nice red perfused color? The difference between central and peripheral cyanosis is like central cyanosis is more like you're not getting proper gas exchange. Like your blood just doesn't have enough oxygen in it, right? Because this is so close to the heart. Blood is definitely getting there, but maybe the blood just doesn't have a lot of oxygen. And again, anemia, looking for pallor. Then you've got the high arched palate, which you can see on this second um, image, right? What the high arched palate means is like you just take the tongue depressor, you like that, push it down, look inside, right? And if they've got a palate that looks like that, it's for Marfan syndrome. And that's just another thing because Marfan syndrome is prone to cardiovascular issues. You also, while you're doing the tongue depressor thing, you look for dentition just in general, like are their teeth like rotten or are they, just, are they good? And then the reason for that is a lot of the times uh, your infective endocarditis actually starts in the mouth and then makes its way to the heart and colonizes there. And then finally, petechiae, like you see on this person's lips here, that is uh, infective endocarditis. You just ask them to like pout for you. And then you look there. Next is the neck. And here's the really important point here. You can do all the previous stuff that the patient is just sitting down however they want, right? And they can be wearing their shirt if, you want, if they want to. But from neck onwards, from like neck and chest, they need to be at a 45 degree an angle on the examination bed, which is really important. And they also need to um, have their shirt off and be like properly exposed. That's really important and you'll actually fail if you don't do that, okay? So neck, first thing you feel is the carotids. You do one side at a time because if you do both, they might pass out. You wanna feel kind of low down because the higher up you go, that's like where the carotid bodies are, where they feel for like blood pressure and they can get like, um, you can make the body think it's high blood pressure, not pain. So you do it pretty low down and what you, do, what you say is, I'm feeling for character and volume. That's what you say and you just say it's normal. Then what you do is you take your stethoscope bell and you listen over the carotids for bruise and you ask them to hold their breath while you do that. So bruise just pretty much mean that in a normal artery, the blood flow is like really nice and straight with no, um, with no uh, what's the word, turbulence, right? 
But if you've got like uh, valve problems or just any kind of problem like that, the blood will start spinning in there and become kind of wavy and turbulent and you'll hear that as bruise. Next, you've got the JVP. So the JVP is the jugular venous pulse, which is the, it's pretty much a way to check like how much like venous pressure do you have for like right heart failure. So you're looking for like a little double pulsatile thing in the neck. It'll be like buh, 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 in the neck, right? And you, once you find that, you do what the images are doing. You get a ruler and get like perpendicular from their sternum and then another ruler to where the thing is because you're just measuring how much higher above the sternal angle the uh, JVP is. Because if it's high up, you can imagine that it's kind of backed up, right? Because you've got a lot of venous pressure because you've got right heart failure and you're not like taking blood in quickly enough, right? So that's what that's telling you. And the other thing you look for is abdominal jugular reflux. So you, point, you push down on the abdomen for 10 seconds um, and then you're looking for the JVP, which you've already found, to rise, because it will for everyone, and it'll return back down if it's normal, but if it's, it's abnormal, if it stays risen up, that's just another thing. Next, we finally move on to the chest. So the chest is, well, the first thing you do with the chest is you inspect it. Really important. So you look for symmetry, uh, deformity, scars, swelling, redness, all the normal stuff. You look, like, you look around here or here, I think, for a pacemaker, and it's like you can see the battery like sitting there in the picture. Uh, then you look at their breathing rate, and you can see if you can see their um, apex beat, like beating straight out of the chest pretty much. That just means like ventricular hypertrophy. Now we move on to palpation. So first thing you want to find is the apex beat. So the apex beat, what you do is you like, it's on the left, and you start off like here at the mid axillary line because you're starting at the worst case, right? Imagine if the heart's so like overgrown that it's like you can feel the heart beat all the way out to the side here, right? And then you kind of move in, right? And then you hope to find it at the fifth intercostal space at the uh, mid clavicular line. That's where you want to find it, the mid clavicular line here, okay? And if you can't feel it, you might want to roll the patient onto this side. Then you've got heaves. So you use the heel of your hand, which is like, this bit, and then you're just trying to feel for like their chest heaving against you as the heart beats. Uh, if it's positive, it once again shows ventricular hypertrophy. And then finally, you, use, uh, you do thrills. So you do the base of your fingers, which is this bit, right, where the um, heart valves are. And what you're feeling for is like palpable murmurs, um, pretty much, which means that there's valve issues and you're getting turbulent blood flow. And I just said you feel we're over where the valves are, and I'm gonna tell you exactly where the valves are. So there's four valves, obviously. There's the aortic valve, right? Which is in the second intercostal space on the right sternal border. And that's there, as you can see in the image. Then you've got the pulmonary, which is also in the second intercostal space, but the left sternal border. So just across the sternum from the aortic. aortic. And it's kind of weird because like, you think of like aorta being like left side, but it's on the right in this case. So that's just a thing to keep in mind. Then you've got the tricuspid valve, which is uh, fourth intercostal space, left sternal border, because it's kind of like straight down from the pulmonary. And finally, you've got the mitral valve, which is in the fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, which is the exact same spot as the apex beat. So just remember that, because when I do the auscultation next, I'm just going to say uh, you do it over XYZ valve, and I'm not going to say where it is, because it's right here for your reference. So you've got. Um, chest auscultation. So first you do normal auscultation without any specific, any special maneuvers. So you listen to all four valves, right? On their locations, but you start off with the bell on the mitral, right? And then you just do diaphragm for all of them, including for the mitral again. So you, mitral is the only one that's different. We do both the bell and the diaphragm. And then you do special maneuvers. So mitral valve, they roll to their left and expire, right? You can think of it because it's the most leftmost valve, so you'd roll to the left, which is, I think, a good way to remember it. And then you've got the tricuspid valve, so you get them to sit up from the 45 degrees to like sitting up straight, and you get them to inspire, breathe in. Pulmonary valve, you get them to lean forward and inspire. Then aortic valve, you get them to continue leaning forward and expire. Memory, memory aids include, you've got those two um, tricuspid and pulmonary valves in the middle, right? And they go up and down, making an eye. So you can remember that those two are the ones you've got to inspire for, right? 
And what are you actually listening for when you do chest auscultations? Well, what you'll hear, so I don't know if you guys have tried, because you might not have stethoscopes at home, but what you hear is you hear like two heart sounds and they sound like lub dub, right? And what you're not looking for anything else. You just hear lub dub, lub dub, right? Okay. And anything else you hear, like more, more sounds, an extra heart sound, whooshing, anything like that, those are murmurs, right? But like real doctors have trouble with murmurs, okay? So don't fret too much. In a CSSE, nine, like, it'll almost definitely be normal. And even if it isn't, they won't expect you to say anything about it. So just say, I can hear a normal S1. Oh, sorry. Someone's got their mic on. You're going to say, I can hear a normal S1 and S2 sound and no additional sounds. That's all you say. Cool. And there's a couple of extra things that you feel for if you've got time. Um, sacral edema. So when they lean forward, you're feeling for um, edema in the sacral area, which is like your lower back. Be sure to tell the patient what you're doing because you don't want to just like come in while you're auscultating them and just like reach around behind them and feel them up like that, right? And then, and then finally, uh, if you've got time, you might want to do petting edema in the legs for right heart failure, but most of the time you won't have time. You can say, well, I would do legs if I had time, but um, sorry, someone's got their mic on, um, I think. Okay, quickly, cardio questions. We don't have a huge amount of time, but if you, you guys just want to um, match these up to their counterpart. You can either put like your answers in the chat or you can yell out and I'll give you like, I'll give you like 20 seconds. We don't have much time. So just take a look at that and see what you think. Whoops, <laughs> that's meant to be, well, it looks like I made a mistake there. Well, it's meant to be peripheral artery disease to intermittent claudication, but yeah, see, it's meant to be orthopnea <laughs> sitting there. But anyway, so you've got infective endocarditis, Osler's nodes, right? Nice, right heart failure, raised JVP because of increased venous pressure. Left heart failure, orthopnea, peripheral artery disease is intermittent claudication and right ventricular hypertrophy would be sternal thrust and heaves. And these are the kind of questions they might ask. Like someone comes in with these like little nodes on their um, fingers that hurt, what might they have, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Cardio is done. We're moving on to the musculoskeletal exam. If you guys just want to clear your annotations, thanks. Okay, cool. So you can peruse those at your leisure. MSK exam, as usual, general inspection. Do they look well? Do they look in pain? MSK, you're looking for stuff like, oh, they have like a sling or a cast posture and body habitus as usual. What you're looking for is, then you look, so what you're looking for is deformity, muscle wasting, scars, swelling, rashes, redness, all those things. And it's, you're looking for the same stuff for whatever joint you're meant to be inspecting. Next, you feel. So what you'll feel first is tenderness. So you feel around just like on the arm or whatever joint. And tenderness is just like when you push down, it hurts and the patient will tell you. And you'll ask like, oh, if you've got any pain, tell me, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you feel for is temperature, which you do with the back of your hand. Then you do swelling and effusion. You'll just feel it because it's there. And then you've got bony landmarks, which I'll list later on. So next you want to do move and measure. Once again, this is pretty general because MSK exam is similar for pretty much every joint. You do active movements where the patient moves the joint, right? You always do the active movements first because the patient kind of knows how much they're able to do with whatever injury or whatever they have. And if you start with passive, you might overextend something and hurt the patient, okay? Next, you've got passive movements, right? So you move the joint. You always hold on to the joint as you move it because you're feeling for crepitus. And you always ask the patient, if you feel any pain or discomfort, please tell me to stop because you don't want to hurt the patient. All the joints have different movements and ranges and I'm not gonna like go through them, but I've got some tables that you can take a look at in your own time. Then you've got the special tests, which we will go into. And then, yeah, so when you do these kind of exams, you ask about pain, you start on the pain-free side um, because so you can compare, you examine bilaterally. So if you do the shoulder, then you do the other bit of the shoulder, like the same movement and you wanna check because you're constantly comparing the sides and watch the patient's face, see if they look in pain. These are the bony landmarks. We literally do not have enough time to go into all of these, but it is really just um, something you'll get good at when you do it and um, take a look at this if you, if you want. Ranges of motion, same thing. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is shoulder abduction, which is this, right? 
Um, actively, they can go all the way up to 180. Passively, they can go to 90, because when you do it, you're holding the scapula down in place, which needs to lift up to continue moving up. That's the only thing for shoulder abduction. That's the only thing we want to talk about here. But here are the ranges of motion for literally every single joint. Um, take a look at it when you've got time. Okay, special tests. So shoulder special tests, you've got the Hawkins test. You pretty much grab onto their shoulder and you're like you're moving the arm down and across like a fulcrum. And you're looking, if they feel pain, rotate a cuff impingement. Near sign, you get them to like internally rotate their arm like this and just like lift it up. If they've got pain, again, rotate a cuff impingement. Painful arc, you get them to like do this with their arms, right? And then if they'll get pain between 60 and 120 degrees, which shows that their, their supraspinatus uh, has been impinged. Impingement is like when um, things get caught and pinched effectively. Empty can test, you can see what they're doing, like thumbs down, you just push down on their arm and you ask them to push up against you. This is meant to test the strength of their supraspinatus. Resisted abduction, you get them to put their arms by their side and abduct out, but you're resisting. If it's weak, then that's supraspinatus, supraspinatus problem again. Um, you have to do it right by their sides because after 15 degrees, the deltoid takes over abductions. So you start testing something else. Then you've got resisted internal rotation. So hand on the small of their back, you, you push down against it and ask them to um, lift off, right? That tests their subscapularis. And then resisted external rotation, elbows at 90 degrees, hands by their sides, resist that as they try to pull it out. That tests their intraspinatus anteriors minor. Now we're moving on to the elbow. So golfer's elbow is the flexors. They all have a common origin, the flexors of your wrist, right? So at the uh, medial epicondyle. And so what you do is you ask the patient to flex their wrist against resistance, as you can see in the picture, right? And uh, if it's painful or they can't do it, that is golfer's elbow. Medial is golfer's flexing, I guess, because like golfer's are really strong or something. I don't know. You can figure out a way to remember that. Um, Lateral epicondylitis, because uh, golfers are always flexing. Lateral epicondylitis is tennis elbow. So this is the same thing as golfer's elbow, but on the lateral epicondyle and your extensor muscles. And the test is the exact same, except you're telling them to extend their wrist against resistance, right? And once again, pain over that epicondyle or weakness and that kind of stuff means that they've got tennis elbow. And what it actually is, is tendonitis. So it's not the muscles that are really having a problem, it's just the tendons have been um, overstretched or like injured a little bit and that's causing the problems for both of these. Wrist and hands. So you've got a couple for carpal tunnel where you just ask them to do this for 30 seconds, valence, which kind of constricts the carpal tunnel. If they get tingling and numbness, they've got carpal tunnel. Tunnels, once again, tapping over the carpal bones to try and um, make the nerve um, tingle again. And then hand tests, you can remember is OKGP. Okay, so opposition, touch the thumb to each of the fingers, key grip, like at the bottom image, how they would hold a key, try to pull it out. If it's, there's weakness, that's all the nerve. Grip tests, just in general, like you can get ask them to hold your two fingers, right? See how strong they are there. And practical tests, you just ask them to do things like write something. Cool. Moving on, moving on to the legs. So hip special tests, you've got measuring the leg length. So Apparent leg length is from the belly button, which is the umbilicus, to your, malle to your medial malleolus, which is like the inside of your ankle, right? And this tests for like things that cause your um, hip to change, uh, just to not be straight, right? Not the actual length of your leg. And true leg length is the same thing, medial mal malleolus to your asus, to your uh, anterior superior iliac spine, which is more about the actual length of the legs, so, like maybe your bones are different lengths or something like that. Then Trendelenburg test, patient stands on one leg. If the non-weight-bearing side rises, it's normal. If the non-weight-bearing side sags, that means that your um, ab abductors, like your gluteus medius, are weak. Thomas test, once again, lying down, you put the hand on their back and you ask them to flex their hip. If the body remains on the bed, then it's normal. If the hip rises, it's like, as you can see in the picture, it's like their whole body's like got a little bit of flexion, so they can't straighten out their legs properly, effectively. And what you're testing the other side to the one that's um, having the leg moved. Knee special tests, patella tap, tap on the patella, see if there's fluid. 
bold sign. You effectively milk fluid down their leg, apply medial lateral pressure, and then you just feel that there's a smaller effusion that you've pulled down. Collateral ligaments, varus and valgus force. You guys can just um, read that. Varus is kind of force that is outwards, right? Valgus is kind of force that's in, like knock kneed versus bow legged. And you do this test at both zero degrees and 30 degrees, and you're testing for the ligaments at the side of the knee. Cruciate ligament tests, the draw test, you just sit on their foot after asking, and you pull forward towards you, that's anterior um, cruciate ligament, and if, if it moves more than usual, or when you push away from you, that's posterior cruciate ligament. Then there's McMurray's test, which is where you internally rotate the heel and extend the knee, or externally rotate the heel and extend the knee, and that tests for your medial and lateral meniscus, uh, uh, respectively. Ankle's pretty easy because they kind of give up after the ankle, honestly. So um, pretty much you just get them to lie on the bed on their stomach, flex their knee, squeeze the calf, and then their leg will um, plant to flex because you're kind of mechanically pulling the Achilles tendon. And um, what that means is if there's a full rupture, even if there's a little bit of Achilles tendon left, this will still work. But if it's a total rupture, then their leg won't flex like that. MSK questions. We don't really have time for this. So I'm just going to move on. Sorry. I think I've only got an hour. So we'll leave it at that. You guys can take a look at that. Central, uh, peripheral nervous system. We're going to have to go really fast with this. So, okay. So as usual, do they look well? All that kind of stuff. Um, then you're looking for deformity, muscle wasting, because that's a, a neuron sign, scars, swelling, in, involuntary movements like twitching. And look at their gait as they walk in. You're checking muscle bulk because if the, noted, the lower motor neuron um, goes off, then your muscles atrophy. And you can also flip them a little bit to try and cause fasciculations, but don't do too much and don't do too hard. Um, movement and motor, you're testing for tone. So you passively grab their joint and just move it really quickly. Spasticity is like, um, it's like easy than hard. And rigidity is like, I'm sorry, spasticity, spasticity is like, I think it gets harder as you move it faster. And rigidity is, uh, it's just the same all the time. It's just really hard to move passively. Power, you do it with the myotomes. So you just um, get them to uh, do movements against resistance, right? And it's on a one to five scale. One is like literally no movement. Two is like twitching. Three is they can move it, but not against gravity. Four is they can move it against gravity, but not against your, um, your resistance. And five is it's normal. Reflexes, that's nerve roots. I'll tell you right now that hyporeflexia is lower motor neuron because lower motor neurons innervate the muscle directly. Hyperreflexia is uh, upper motor neuron because the up, your brain doesn't actually control reflexes, but it does send inhibitory signals to make sure the reflexes don't go too hard. So that's something to think about. Coordination, finger nose test, and dysdiadecokinesia, that's usually cerebellar. And then you've got. Uh, sensory tests like pain and temperature, which test your spinothalamic tract. Vibration, proprioception, and light touch, they test your dorsal columnar medial lim limniscus. I can never say that right. Pathway, just remember that. And two point discrimination stereognosis is the sensory cortex, which is part of your brain. Myotomes, there you go. Take a look at them. It's just what nerve roots control um, what muscle movements. Dermatomes, again, just look at these and um, remember them pretty much and sensory tests i'll talk a little bit more about them so you do the pain light touch sensory tests on the dermatomes right and the pain one tests for spinothalamic tract light touch tests for the dorsal columnar medial meniscus and vibration is you just do it at the most distal part and see when if you do it with a tuning fork and see if they can feel the vibration and can feel it stop right and if they can feel it at the most distal part then it's fine if they can't, you go more and more um, proximal. Proprioception is like grab the sides of one of their digits or toes, close their eyes and just move it up or down and ask them to tell you where it stopped, okay? And then when you do all these tests, um, tell them to close their eyes and don't be like, can you feel that, right? Because if you say, can you feel that? They might just be like, yes, because nobody wants to like be sick, okay? So they might subconsciously cheat and think that they felt it, okay? Um, interpretation of PNS signs. I mentioned hypo versus hyperreflexia. Tone, hypotonia is lower motor neuron because you kind of just go floppy. Hypertonia is upper motor neuron and Parkinson's is resting tremor, slow movements, cold rigidity. And then 
once again, you probably know these nerves. We don't really have time to get into them. You can take a quick look at this after, but I think that's it. PNS questions, take a look at these later. Anyone have any questions? I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Any questions in the chat? Okay, um, on the exam, do we need to know reflex roots? Um, I don't remember really knowing them that well because they kind of removed myotomes from what we needed to know last year. So you probably don't. And then other question is, on the exam, will we get MCQs on the systems review questions, picking out the correct and incorrect one? You might get uh, questions like that, but more likely you'll probably get like, um, someone comes in with like these symptoms, like they, with orthopnea or something, and what can this point to? That's more likely what you're gonna get. Anything else? Nah, okay, cool. I'm gonna stop recording and I'm, who's the next? Um,